Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I pray you sing that from the depths of your very soul. And it is not just words, that it has meaning and desire attached to it. God does not desire our lip service. He desires every fiber of our being. And I pray collectively that this body and this house and this gathering that we all continue to press in deeper to him and we desire to be tried by fire to become more righteous, God. We don't want to stay baby Christians. We want to mature and we want to advance your kingdom, Lord. So I ask you, burn us up, God. Burn our desires, burn our hearts. Whatever grieves you, let it grieve us. And let it not be limited to a Sunday morning, but a lifetime of servanthood. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Welcome, church, to Family Church. If this is your first time, My name is Jared. I'm glad you are here. I am the associate pastor. Um, My my dad is, if you were here, was anybody here last week? I was not. I was on, wow, good. We were on vacation for my birthday. Um, Just, (laughs) thanks. Yay me, just kidding. Uh, We were were on vacation to get away, and uh, it was nice to just have a, a day of rest, well, a couple days of rest. Um, but if you expected to see him again, he is in Ocean Isle. He should be preaching actually right now at the same time that I'm about to do this. So I was message, messaging him this morning about, uh, I think, 6.30, 6.20 or so when I got here, uh, that today, I believe today is the very first time that him and I would be preaching at the same time on a Sunday morning. Uh, nothing crazy, but I think that's kind of cool. Uh, This morning, if you are joining us and weren't here for the first one a few weeks ago, we are in the second episode of a series called Contend. We are walking through the book or letter of Jude. It's only 25 short verses. You can read it in just a few minutes every single day. And as we walk through this, you see that the climate is very much the same uh, then as it is now, especially in America. And you will, uh, I I hope today is... uh, very eye-opening. Where's my little lever? There we go. Um, y'all are like, why's he got a table? I didn't, the pulpit felt like a wall, so I wanted <laughs> a table where I could see you a little better. Um, so we're, we're walking through Jude, and uh, it's, it's, it's short, but it's blistering. Um, so if you are new here, and you're expecting a feel-good, uh, Jesus, give me a new boat and a new house, um, you unfortunately have come to the wrong place. We are setting our hearts deeper on God to be more holy with him, to be more holy to him, because he came down and died for us, his son, Jesus, who is one of the Trinity, and he, he came down from heaven to be fully man and fully God, and uh, we're just not satisfied with cotton candy Christianity in the American church anymore, and it's, it's plaguing the American church to be comfortable instead of being consecrated. So the whole goal of this series is to contend, from verse 3, contend for the faith. And if you remember in week 1, we see that, just to give you a recap, Jude, is he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Uh, Jude is also, James being Jesus' brother, this makes Jude Jesus' brother, but he doesn't equate himself with familiar uh, relationship. 
He doesn't care about being Jesus' brother as much as, y'all, the devil is fighting our technology today, and I am sick of it. You can't have it. Uh, so he doesn't equate himself <laughs> with Jesus. He wants to just be a servant. So his main goal is to just be a servant of Jesus. He didn't care to elevate himself with status by being Jesus' brother. He simply wants to be a servant. And then he tells us to those who are called, beloved uh, in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. This letter is full of triads. It's full of themes of three. As we walk through it, recognize them. Numbers have meaning. God's, the God's word is breathed and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Everything has meaning. There's no just throwaway idle words, especially in this. Uh, so he calls all of us because we are all called, we're all beloved in God the Father, and we're all kept for Jesus Christ. And then he prays over us, over the audience of this letter that received it, which we still get now because the Bible is not just a history book. It is not what just has happened. It is what is always happening. And so he prays over us, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you because you're going to need all three to walk through life. And just a heads up, this entire letter is on false prophets that plague not only the church in this day, but the church today. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's a disgusting, disturbing problem. So he says that in verse 3, he was very eager to write to them about the common salvation. He wanted to tell them something that would make them feel good, something that would make them be happy. Does that sound familiar like America? Yeah, he wanted to make you feel good and talk about how God would bless you. And if you do step A, B, and C, follow this eight-point program, uh, your microphone would work in Jesus' name. And then you would also be able to be blessed and receive such and such. (laughs) The devil is a liar. Luckily, my voice is loud enough. If you're watching a live stream, I'm sorry, it's going to just keep cutting out. We got to figure it out this week. Um, So he calls instead, instead of the common salvation, he found it necessary to write to contend for the faith. If you thought your faith in Jesus was just coming and sitting in these seats, unfortunately, you're wrong. Uh, You actually do have to fight for this. Faith without, without works is dead. No, I do not mean that you have to work for your faith. You have to work for salvation. That is a lie from the enemy. Only Jesus could do it. You could do nothing. You could not save yourself. There's nothing you can do, ever could do, did do. Your mama couldn't do it. Your brother couldn't do it. Nobody can save you except for Jesus Christ, the risen son of God. But as this is, we have to fight for it. And we see it so much now in this country that if If it's Christianity, it's getting attacked. Nobody's attacking Allah. Nobody's attacking Muhammad. Nobody's attacking Buddha and Confucius. You look at uh, what just recently happened in the Olympics where they made the mockery of the um, Last Supper. And if you're under the belief that, oh, it was just about the Greek gods, uh, that's little g gods. Those are demonic gods. They're false gods. So right there, we're already in the demonic And the other side of it is the very guy that created it, the name of that thing, whatever you want to call it, in French was about the Last Supper. It was called the Last Supper on whatever body of water it was in in Paris. So the whole thing was a mockery of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you can argue all day that you want that, oh, the painting of the Last Supper is probably not biblical and this and that. The point being is that we... If, even if you were an atheist, you could look at it, and people that are non-believers still recognized that it was mocking Jesus Christ. And I just want to take a moment, too, since I, I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, if, if you're in this building now and you don't quite believe yet, you do belong before you believe. You can keep coming in here and, and entering into this, this time of meeting heaven and calling heaven down and walking through God's word, and you can keep coming, and that seed will keep getting planted Life, and I pray that the Holy Spirit convicts you and that eventually you will come to know God because without you will not come to know God and only know eternal suffering and eternal damnation. I say that not to scare you, but to wake you up. If you are under any other pastor in this country or anywhere else and they are not telling you of your sin 
and not calling you to repent. They are leading you to damnation because they're trying to reject the very notion that there is a hell. It does exist. No, it was not made for humans. No, it was not a loving God that made hell for humans. God made hell the rebellious demons. And humans, us, we choose to go there. Let's pray. I'm ready to get to work. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come into this atmosphere and to enter into this talk with you, this worship with you. God, I pray that you wake us up for what you want us to know, that you strike our hearts with the fiery arrows of the Holy Spirit, God. Strike us, put a fire in our bones and help us as we walk through this to understand it. And God, in my weakness, help me speak it. Holy Spirit, fill me For I am just a vessel. Use my vocal cords. Hijack this service, God. Bring revival to this city so we can bring revival to this nation and turn its heart back to you, God. Convict them, Lord. Convict me. Convict us. Teach us, God. And in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless name, go look those words up. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 In 1933, a man that you all will probably know, unless they don't teach this in American schools anymore, uh, because we're too busy learning about rainbow flags and which binary code you want to be. But in 1933, there was a man named Hitler that was made chancellor over Germany. And then the Nazi regime regime started to make anti-Jewish policies and then eventually the laws. And in April of 1933, they began to boycott Jewish businesses. And in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws formalized racial discrimination against the Jews. They made it legal to be racist against the Jews. And in 1938... On the unfortunate night of November 9th and 10th, Jewish homes, businesses, and their synagogues were destroyed and lit on fire, and tens of thousands of them were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Do we remember this? It was not until 1941 that the Holocaust then took off even further after they invaded the Soviet Union and the systematic extermination of Jews began. Now, we didn't have social media like we do back then. I'm sorry, we don't have it. They didn't have it back then as we have it now, so they didn't have the same type of news, you know, that tells you what they want you to know. And it was later in December of 1941 that we know the unfortunate day of Pearl Harbor happened and brought America into the conflict against the evil. And in 1944 and 45, the Americans began liberating the camps and they found the full extent of the depravity and evil and disgusting things that they were doing to these people. Now for us, it's hard to believe because like them, we get so wrapped up, like them meaning the people back then, not uh, the Hitler and, and the Nazis and all that, but like them, We get into the mindset of just going through the daily grind that we forget that there's other people that even exist and that there's other things that go on in the world. We forget that as Christians uh, in in North Korea, our brothers and sisters cannot even uh, obtain or read the word of God for they will be also thrown into a labor camp, a concentration camp. We know that uh, in China, there's also persecution as well. And and in uh, the Middle East, where there's Islam, the wonderful religion of peace that will hack your face off and cut your head off if you don't deny Jesus Christ, even though they're still going to do it if you do. And then you'll be in hell because you denied him before man. But they want to kill you. And we have such a hard time realizing and knowing and understanding the level of that evil. We, we essentially just refuse to believe that somebody could be so demonic. It's heavy. But then we come to the Bible in much the same way. And we get tired of pastors that end up 
speaking the truth of the word, just walking through the scriptures. And if you go into a church and they just open it up and bring you verse by verse and exegete it and tell you the, the original meaning and the true meaning and the interpretation, and we walk through it, we're so used to wanting to be entertained by the circuses that we call churches that as soon as we start hearing cold, hard truth, we reject the pastor for they are too angry, they are too harsh, their words are too rough around the edges, they're not polished. They don't wear certain clothes. We have this mindset of what someone should look like, how old they should be, what qualifications they should have in order to preach the word of God. And I don't know if you have read your Bible at any point in time. Uh, the only person that was actually fully qualified within the Bible is Jesus Christ himself. Yes. About King David, who's prophesied, to, build, to be king, and then his son build the temple, Solomon, to build the temple. This is prophesied to him before he commits adultery with Bathsheba and then has her husband murdered. God took into account his sin before he called him, as he does with you. He already knew everything you would do, everything you still will do, do and he keeps you in his love. He already reconciled you to himself if you are a believer, and there's nothing you can do unless you're not a true believer that will remove you from his grace. You cannot make yourself be unloved by God. You can make your wife mad. You can make your husband mad. Kelsey just mean mugged me right there. You can, you can make your kids mad. You can make God upset, but he loves you nonetheless. But we, we come to this and we get tired of pastors just preaching truth. There's not enough of us just preaching truth, just walking through and saying, this is what the word says, whether you like it or not. It's God's word, it's God's will, it's God's way, it's laid out for us, the good, the bad, the ugly, it tells us everything that has happened, and it applies to our life, but know this, it's not about you and me, it's simply the entire book from front to back is all about Jesus Christ. But we get scared of the truth, and then we end up distancing ourselves from the dangers that plague the, tr the, the, the church. And the church is not this. This is a building. You are the church. You are the church. When you go out, you're still the church. You're still the body of Christ. And so in Jude's day and in our day, there's false prophets that are both a threat and a testament to the truth of Christianity. It's easy to get in fear when we hear of false prophets because we think, oh no, what are they gonna do? They're leading people astray. But if there were no false prophets, then Jesus Christ himself would have been a liar. Y'all upset with that. If it wasn't there, it's a testament to Jesus Christ telling the truth, the fact that there are false prophets, <laughs> they're never going to go away. They're always going to be here. They're always going to be leading people astray. There will be one antichrist that comes at the end of the day, but there are many antichrists that have already been here and that are still here. The people that are antichrist, that's preaching a false gospel and leading people astray and leading them into eternal damnation. And so I want to echo what Winston Churchill said in 1948 in the aftermath of World War II where he said those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. He's calling them to remain vigilant against threats. And Jude here, well before the time of Winston Churchill, is telling you to remain vigilant against threats to contend for the faith. Now, if you go on YouTube, you'll see a, a, a mighty bunch of watchdogs that it's like their whole duty in life is just to go find false prophets. We don't need to find them. We don't need to seek them out. To do what you need to do. I guess God's working on my patience today. What you need to do is know the truth. Like studying money so you can see counterfeits, you need to know what God said so that way when someone comes at you with something he didn't say, you don't just accept it because it sounds good. Because the Bible tells you that they will cleverly preach false doctrine. Cleverly. They're good at it. 
And with that, with me, do not stand here, sit here, I guess, because I'm the one standing. Don't just sit here and listen to me and believe everything I say. Test me. Constantly. Every day. Go back, listen to things I said beforehand and test it. The Bible says to test the spirits and make sure they're from God. So you need to understand the truth in order that you know when a false prophet comes. Because in America, we, we equate uh, calling with status. And we think automatically if someone has a big church and they have a, a big following and a, and a big YouTube and a big Instagram and they have all this stuff going on, we think that means that God's hand of approval is on them. We think if they're blessed and they're wealthy that God's hand is on them. Unless you're typically from the world where they just believe that every pastor just steals all of the money in the offering plate as if uh, the giving is not important to keep the lights on and the AC going. And with that, please continue your giving. <laughs> My dad told me to remind you guys that today um, because obviously if you remember, we did purchase the 68, 55 acres of land in order to further the gospel down there. We cannot pray a building over there. We have to provide the money and the means to get a building there. God is not a genie. So we think just because someone has a lot of stuff as a pastor and in a church that that means God, that we completely forget that Satan himself tempted Jesus himself with wealth in the wilderness. Y'all didn't catch that. You think that a pastor is successful and he's anointed and he's called simply because he fills seats and he has big buildings and he has big followings and they can go and do conferences and write books and Satan tempted Jesus with wealth. And so we have in much the same way and in much now as it was then the false prophets that still plague us and still come against us. We cannot act like they do not exist. We have to know the truth in order to contend for the faith. This doesn't mean you have to go out and punch a false prophet in the face. It simply means you to be able to not be led astray by them and also be able to help people that are under their care Amen. from being led astray. Amen. Now, with Jude, some Christians are so positive that they are afraid to be negative. We have to preach nicely. We have to sound good. I don't like how Jared furrows his eyebrows and everything looks good. Very serious. This is just my resting blessed face, okay? This is my happy, my happy face. It's the forehead like a flint of steel like Ezekiel had. Uh, <laughs> But they're so, they're so positive, they're afraid to speak, out against the, uh, uh, to speak out against the negative, and they think we're just supposed to let bygones be bygones, and, you know, oh, we just keep our hand off of it, and don't worry about it, we'll just pray about it. Let, let God do it, we'll just pray about it. No, Jude himself, Jude, through the guidance, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's why it's in God's Word, tells you, contend for the faith. Jude is not worried about being positive. Jude is not worried about not offending you. Jesus wasn't either. Go study him. Go study Jesus. Not this holy child, meek and mild. No, we don't worship the baby Jesus in the manger. We worship the glorified Jesus. That when John saw him, when he went and had the revelation, he fell down like a dead man because he could not fathom the glory of God. Because in our sinful nature, we cannot look upon him until we are made righteous. So Jude is not worried about that. He is brutally open. He's brutally honest with this. Because when people threaten your existence, the existence of Christianity, you cannot walk up to them and shake their hand. If they're threatening your existence, you need to stand up and speak up. You need to contend for the faith. We'll get to the text. This is still the introduction. Christianity in America is dying. Dying. You're like, wow, look at this. There's a lot of people and there's all these churches. No, it's dying. I looked it up. In a list of the top 20 countries of growth for Christians, top 20, USA is nowhere on the list. But with that, the conversion rate to Christianity in China, China, 
that overpopulated place that you see, the conversion rate to Christianity in China is nearly eight times higher than their population growth. And according to this chart, atheism is actually on the decline. And we amen that, but then stuck in the country that's not on the list and we're watching it die and we come in Sunday after Sunday and then just, hey, amen, amen. And then as soon as we're done, boop, turn on Cardi B and whop it on out of here. And then we do nothing to praise God and worship God. We do nothing to contend for the faith. Oh, Lord. Coming back next week. God, you're not... <laughs> You're not supposed to feel good in church. You're supposed to be convicted and grow up. To grow up. You're, you're nowhere in the Bible are you referred to as an adult. Always a child. To be childlike. But we're too busy being childish in the church. Because we want to focus on titles. We want to focus on blessings and anointing. Who can sing this song? Who can do that? Who can lead the small group? What temperature is the AC on? We, we're so stuck in comfort mentality that we have no consecration to our calling. I'm not here to pat your butt. I'm here to wake you up to the reality. Time is running out. Your days are numbered. My days are numbered. Every prophecy for Jesus, he is basically standing at the door with his hand on the knob, waiting for God to say go. Every prophecy for him to split the sky, to crack it open and suck us up into the clouds is done. Is done. You live in the day and age where revelation can finally happen. You live in the day and age where revelation can finally happen. The Bible said that there will be two prophets murdered in the street, and their body will be left for three days, and the entire world will watch. How will they watch? Everyone has a cell phone now, including the homeless. Everyone has a cell phone now. We are literally living on borrowed time. So I am trying to get you to understand my heart and the passion behind me to wake yourself up and go and preach the gospel to the lost because just because you have it doesn't mean that's where it ends. You need to get your butt out of these seats, go out into the world, Matthew 28, 19, you go forth and make disciples. That was not just a charge to his people. That's a charge to you. You cannot read that, and if you feel nothing, God help your soul. God, why couldn't you have me be nice? So Jude, <laughs> Jude writes this letter telling us to persevere and contend. And we will be in three verses today. Oh, I got to hurry up. Three verses. And he doesn't start here. We know that we're supposed to contend for the faith from what we learned the last, uh, not last week, the week before. We know we have to contend for the faith. He doesn't tell you how to do that yet. He opens with a call and urgency to them and to us to remember. Right. To remember. Right. Verse five, Jude. Now. I want to, what word? Remind. Remind you. Although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward, y'all don't like holy little, oh, happy Jesus. Oh, he just accepted everybody, know what they did with their sin. And, you know, they kept living in whatever they wanted to do, and he didn't matter that they blasphemed his name, and he was just holy child, meek and mild, and he accepted everybody into heaven, and there's once saved, always saved, and he's just happy with everybody. Sin is no more after he lived on the cross, after he died on the cross, and he rose again. There's nothing going on. Oh, no, that says afterward, destroy those who did not believe. I want to draw your attention to the word remind, to remember, to remind you. You have heard this before, although you once fully knew it. You know everything I'm about to say, but just because you heard it doesn't mean you understand it. If you remember, if you were here for the team talk, and I was talking about how we're supposed to pray at all times, and I said it about 50 times, hearing is not understanding. 
For those of you who were hungry enough to get here to the revival on Wednesday night, and yes, you missed out if you did not come. If you were hungry enough to reject Wednesday night, whatever else you were doing, because there's nothing more important than getting in here and learning about God and worshiping God. If you were hungry enough to be here, you would know that much like this, hearing doesn't always mean understanding. It has to reach your heart. The parable of the sower or the soil. Newsflash, go study it, Matthew 13. There's four responses. Four. One is positive. The other three all reject it. This is out of Jesus' mouth himself, the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher, the living word of God telling them, can you imagine if Jesus was here standing and you were under his how that would be to be in his presence. And he flat out tells all of us that 75% of people, all four of these responses are in this room right now. And 75% of people will reject him. Do you see the need to wake up? Do you see the need for it to strike your soul and your heart? And then it says, Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Now, this is, this, is, this is mind-boggling if you've read Exodus because we think, oh, Moses led these people out. But this is telling us that Jesus is active in this event. Jesus saved the people out of Egypt. But not everybody wanted to be saved. The parable of the sower. We know that they come out of Egypt. They spend 400 years in slavery in Egypt. They're enslaved, and then God sends Moses to bring them out. So then they're rescued. And now they have freedom, but then they turn back and they decide, never mind, and they die into eternal bondage. They were enslaved rescued and given freedom, and then they still wanted the bondage. They literally told them, uh, told Moses, and they complained and they grumbled, I wish we would have just died back in Egypt. They send 12 spies into the promised land, the land that is, it's literally in the name, promised. They're supposed to get it. They know they're going to get it, and they get, they go there, the, the fruit is so just amazing and different than what we have now that the cluster of grapes, they have to carry it on a pole between two people because of how massive it is. But 10 out of the 12, the majority, decide to reject it because they're too cowardly. And then God tells them that the entire generation, there's two million of these people, and an entire generation will die out. And they can't enter. And they spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Why? Because of their rebellion. What, is what does this mean? I hate this microphone right now. The devil is a liar. God can be doing good things in your life. He can be doing great things in your life. Everything can be going together. He can be blessing you. He can be making you prosper. He can make your business do well. He can be giving you good health. But if you do not have repentance of your sins, none of that matters. What matters is that you repent so that you have salvation. Now, repentance is not crying from the consequences. Repentance is not crying and feeling sad because you got caught. Repentance is turning away and rejecting it and walking towards God, towards Jesus, and saying, I'm not doing that anymore. And yeah, you might back up sometimes and you might stumble, but in his sovereignty, in his patience, in his grace, he still seeks you out and lifts you out of it. Y'all are not excited about being saved. They were liberated, liberated, like we are liberated from our sins. And then they go through a symbolic baptism through the Red Sea. And then they're sustained by God in the wilderness. What is this? This is literally experiencing the care and provision of Jesus Christ, even 
in the wilderness. In, the, in your wilderness, you still have Jesus seeking you out, running to you like the father in the prodigal son story saying, I know you're still in this, but I still love you. Come back into my arms. Come back into my house. Come back into the fold. Come back into the grace. And he saves you and rescues you. And on the other side of that story, you have the elder brother, the religious person was here (laughs) so long and I did nothing wrong I should be saved too and and he rejects going into the house what is this don't miss your chance for salvation simply because you think what you do for God will get you there and in 1 Corinthians 10 I'll try to go fast so y'all can get to Arby's nobody's going to Arby's It's not on the screen, so hopefully you got a Bible. If not, bring one. I'll read it quick. This is a warning against idolatry. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food. They had literal manna. They had food come down from heaven to help sustain them. Heavenly food, a miracle. God took care of everything they needed in the wilderness. They all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that fo- uh, that followed them, that rock and that and the oh my lord and the rock was Christ. Verse five. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Sexual immorality, that's what the play means. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. They missed out simply because they were too busy complaining instead of accepting what God was telling them to go and do. If God tells you, go do this, he's already there in front of you, doing it for you. All you have to do is trust and walk forward and meet him in the, in the battle. All you've got to do is walk forth into the battle. God will meet you where you need to go. God will sustain you where you need to go. God will give you the strength for where you need to go. He will give you the anointing for where you need to go. If he's telling you to go, it's already done. You've just got to go meet him there and see it. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. What is this? God is showing you he did not tolerate their faithlessness. He did not tolerate their rebellion. He saved them like he saves us, like he saves you. And then we rebel and we turn our back on him and we expect him to tolerate it. But these were his chosen people that he chose to bring forth the very salvation. Through Abraham, it began not with Adam, it began with Abraham. That's who the covenant was made with. And Jesus descends from that, but he is born of the virgin mother, not an earthly father. But he comes from that line, this line of established people. And if God didn't tolerate theirs, why do we think he's going to tolerate ours? Verse 6. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, 
He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. The angels. They did not stay in their own position of authority. So they had authority in their position. They had heavenly gifts to use. They had heavenly roles take to do. They had heavenly assignments. And we know that Lucifer, I said this in the team talk, Lucifer was one of three archangels. You had Gabriel in charge of bringing messages. You had Michael in charge of warfare. Thank God he's still on our side. And then you had Lucifer, who in Ezekiel 28 is referred to as the, uh, the chief musician. The King James says his body was made of, of pipes. And another thing, how he deceived us so, so much is when we think of the devil, we think of this little red guy with a pitchfork and horns. Newsflash, he's beautiful. Beautiful. So you are easily deceived by him. You know who's not mentioned as being beautiful in the Bible? Jesus said he, he, he was like normal looking, not beautiful, so people would just follow him because he was attractive. But we follow what's attractive. So he's the chief musician. And it says they left their position of authority in their proper dwelling. At some point in time, before, uh, I'm, at some point before time, time began with the fall. That's when it started. So at some point before time, he was in heaven and he somehow probably got a glimpse of himself and pride rooted up within him. That's the original sin, pride. He gets prideful and he starts going around to the other angels in heaven and they let sin take root and then they reject God and he cast them out of heaven. He cast them out of his authority. And Jesus says in Luke 4 verses, and this was from the uh, revival night, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah when he gets rejected at Nazareth. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, he has anointed me to what? Proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. Pay attention. Proclaim the good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are what? Oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He is anointed, he's appointed, he's commissioned by God, by the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Son of God. So what is this? uh, Demons do not possess authority. They possess people. Why? Because we can get the authority through Christ. We get the authority through the Holy Spirit. So he wants to possess you. He wants to possess people to stop you from getting that authority because they no longer have any. They want you to be like them. So what does Jesus do in Luke uh, 4? He tells us that he came to preach the gospel, number one. The good news. Forgiveness and salvation to all who call upon him, who receive him, all. Those who don't look like you, red, brown, yellow, black, white, no matter the country. I know in the South, we got a problem with black people. Guess what? They're called and saved too. And when you enter into the body of Christ, you no longer have that identity. You are just simply a child of God. There is no more race. There is no more division. There should not be division. That's demonic. But you have a body of Christ, the church. We're one family. Family. That's where we get our name from, family church, to be in the family of God. Salvation for all who receive him, the poor, the humble, the rich the lowly, the broken. He calls both the rejected, the people that are overlooked, the people that are, oh, the people that are overlooked. I'm trying to keep it for the live stream audience. And the people that reject them right. if they repent and turn. Right. 
So he says he came to preach the gospel. And then he says to proclaim freedom for those in sin, not to continue to sin, to get out of it, to repent and turn from the sin. He gave you freedom from it. This is spiritual freedom and physical freedom. Number three, to heal. Did you see how the positioning was in those verses? Healing was third. To heal. What was most important? Your forgiveness and your salvation and your freedom from sin. This is why some people are not healed. This is why we think Jesus was being nice when he healed people and at the pool of Bethesda, he walked over other people and found the man who was there for 38 years. We don't know if there was people there that had a longer infirmity, but he walked over people and if that was you, you would be tempted to be mad at him because he neglected to heal you. Some of us are going to be left with infirmities. Some of us are going to be left with unhealed bodies and broken bodies and open wounds until we get to glory. You're not promised to be healed here, only there in eternal glory where there's no more sadness, where he will wipe every tear, where you will have no physical problems, where you will have no emotional problems. There will not be deception. There will not be depression. There will not be bitterness. There will not be anger. There will not be hatred. There will not be division. There will not be issues. There will not be brokenness. There will not be sin. There will not be shame. There will not be issues. There will not be depression. There's no sadness. There's no alcoholism. There's no addiction. There's no drug problems. There's no lust problems. You're going to be in eternal glory forever. Sanctified. Made whole. Somebody shout for God. Yes. Woo. The blinds, the bruised, the beaten, the broken, the bitter, the betrayed, and the berated. You're all healed. And then fourth, true freedom from Satan. And he says, the year of the Lord, what is that? That is the time when salvation is available to all who call upon him. Now. Now. As soon as he was resurrected, you had it. (laughs) As soon as he was resurrected, that time was now. That is Jude verse 3. The the faith that was once delivered for all saints. We are living in this time. We are living in this moment. Right now, we are in his glory. We are in the kingdom of God. We have it. And then he says they're kept in chains. Why? They rebelled. The angels rebelled like we rebel. So they don't have authority. They neglected their responsibilities. In Luke 9, Jesus calls the disciples and he gives them power and he gives them authority over all demons. And then he sends them out. That's not just them, that's you. You've got power, you've got authority over all demons. And he wants to send you out. That's why we come here and we gather and we feast and we learn and we get encouraged and we get empowered to God. And then he sends us back out into the world to what? Spread the gospel and make disciples. That's Matthew 28. In 18, that's Luke. It's one of these. Never mind, I didn't say that one. I got three. Jesus in Matthew 28 and 18 through 19, he says, all authority has been given to me, given to him, given to Jesus. And then he gives you a command, a command. You should be doing it, a command to go and make disciples. To set captives free to preach the gospel, to tell them about the freedom from the sin, to heal people, to pray, healing over them, go forth, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What's he telling you to do? Conduct warfare, to 
contend for the faith. Don't just sit in here and let your butt get numb. Go out and beat hell in the face. Jesus is not weak, he's not woke, he's not a sissy. So why is the American church so anemic and apathetic and lazy and just flat out pathetic? Because we're good at shouting sometimes, but when it comes to doing it and putting it into practice, we freeze up. Why? Reputation? Are you worried about your reputation? I don't preach to you. I preach to an audience of one. An audience of one. That is my reputation. A child of God. Saved by Jesus Christ. Who is king. Who who killed my sin. Who took my shame. Who took my lust. Who took my anger. Who took my disappointment. Who took my depravity and shame. And ripped it out of my soul. And said you are spotless. He says, go out, teach them my words, and be obedient. I am with you always. Always. Verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, Serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. This is all still under remind you. This is all still under remember. This is all still under you've heard these things. We know these things. We've read these things. But he says, I want to remind you even though you heard it. Remember these things. Sinful. Sodom and Gomorrah. They were full of lust, homosexuality. Y'all, it was so bad there that two angels come and it says that all, all the men, young and old, And the word young in the original meant adolescence. I'm sorry if your kids are in here, but we have kids' church. What did they want to do? They wanted to gang rape the men. Angels. They didn't know they were angels. It was men. All of the men, young and old, wanted to come, and they come beating on Lot's door and say, let them out. We want to have sex with them. The children are involved in this. That's how bad it is. And we see our classrooms in this country being filled with crap and rainbows, which is a mockery of the light that surrounds the throne of Jesus. And we're just like, wow, the school system's terrible. I wish I could homeschool. Man, get involved. Find out what your kids are reading. Find out what your kids are doing. Go to a parent-teacher conference and stand up and say, I don't know what that flag is, but take it down. Take it. Where are y'all at? Do y'all not have kids? Do you not care about kids? They say if you let them fall into sin, it's better that a millstone be tied around your neck. Better to be dead than to lead someone into sin. And y'all get mad at me for calling it out. No, I'm not going to be better off dead by not calling out sin. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to stand up for God because there ain't enough people doing it in this country. Second Peter 2.10, he tells us that those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion which was sexual immorality from homo- and homosexuality, and they despise authority. It was bold and willful to do this. And he said, they don't tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. They don't care to mock God. Did we see where <laughs> Kamala Harris in the recent uh, rally Somebody shouts, Jesus is Lord, and she says, you're at the wrong rally. You're at the wrong rally. And there's more than one recording. We're probably getting kicked off live stream, which the microphone ain't working, so whatever. <laughs> Listen, I'm not trying to get political. 
But if you're wanting to vote for someone that literally says, if you consider Jesus is Lord, if you think Jesus is Lord, you're at the wrong party, go vote for someone else. You should really be having a heart check for what you're doing. It's because I don't want mean tweets and bad feelings. I want gas prices that don't feel like I'm selling my soul. I want my schools to be more involved about caring for the teaching of my children than indoctrinating my children. They literally put it in your face now. And she says, and they say, if you want to vote for me, don't think Jesus is Lord. That's a paraphrase of what she just said. I don't care if you think that's a little too heavy and you don't like it. If you think Jesus is God, you do not vote for someone who says you're at the wrong place if you believe so. Put your money where your mouth is and stand for God. Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, widespread sin on a massive level. This is what we see in our country right now, in our churches right now, where you have people with rainbow sashes saying, well, Jesus wasn't actually the son of God. The Bible's not reliable, but then they also use verses out of the Bible to try to say all that kind of crap. And they want you to deny Jesus his deity, which immediately will negate you from your salvation. And they have invaded the church. They've stayed invading. It has not ended. It was the same then as it is now. And it says they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. There's other places in scripture where they were so bad that they say it would, it's gonna be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on judgment day than it was for you. I cannot imagine what God thinks of America right now. The reason we're not a shard of glass from being judged is because God is patient. Now, if you read his word and you know his word and you don't just take it at face value, you can see throughout the Old Testament that they rebelled and neglected and they rebelled and they neglected and they rebelled and they neglected and the wrath gets stored up until it overflows and it has to be poured out. How close are we for God's judgment to be pouring out on this country? So you understand my passion when I get up here and scream and shout and slap the Bible and do all this crazy stuff when I'm simply saying, America, you got to wake up. You need to understand you're headed towards judgment. God is not going to sit here and be mocked. He's not going to be tamed. He's not just happy-go-lucky. We're playing with literal fire. Exactly. I'm so tired of people saying, oh, Jesus is this, and he didn't raise his voice. Dude sat down, made a whip, and beat people for selling stuff in the temple. And that wasn't selling t-shirts or Bibles. That's because you had to go to the temple at a certain time, and they had to offer sacrifices. Now, some people traveled from a long distance away, so they couldn't carry the animals there. And what those people were doing, the den of thieves, the house of robbers that they were doing, they were overcharging people so exponentially that they were robbing them. It was basically blaspheming God because you're supposed to have an animal to sacrifice to him, and they're overcharging people so much for stuff that they just needed to do. So he throws them out. They were wiped out. Ezekiel in 16 and 49 and 50, it tells us what their guilt was. Now listen to this. (laughs) Oh God. Pride, got a whole month for that. Excess of food. 
pride, excessive food. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. Pride, excessive food, prosperous ease. You've got all this money that life is easy for you. Even in a bad economy, you just take it easy. Sell three kids to get a gallon of milk, but we got prosperous ease. But did not aid the poor and needy. Pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. Does that not sound like now? Does that not sound like some churches? That when a hurricane hits, there's not enough people jumping up to sacrifice their time or their money or their possessions in order to give people things so they can continue to live and survive after they just lost everything. Regardless of whatever the event was, there was not enough of an outpouring, not from this house. This house came together. Kelsey and I took a 22-foot trailer completely packed full. Justina Hatchie, we've got uh, another shipment that is, that is already flown up, I think, to North Carolina. And that hallway, for the love of God, please, we have enough things. You can stop now but because I can't even get in my office anymore. <laughs> but there was just churches that didn't do anything. Amen. Now, for some people... They don't think Sodom and Gomorrah was an actual event. But there is archaeological evidence for what is the equivalent of a nuclear strike and flaming tar from heaven. This isn't even from... A biblical person. This is Professor James Kennett at the University of California at Santa Barbara. So I don't know anything about this guy. I mean, he's in California, so that's unfortunate. (laughs) And he says that they have found evidence of destruction from the same time and area of Sodom and Gomorrah, that it laid waste to the Jordan River Valley in a 100-acre city along with other cities. That there was a detonation possibly two and a half miles above the earth. And even though it was that high, it still would send a 740 mile per hour shockwave. The human remains that were found showed that they were either blown apart or incinerated with evidence of temperatures reaching 2,000 degrees Celsius, and for you Americans, that's 3,632 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot. There was an international team that found building materials and pottery shards that had melted into glass. And there was mud bricks that had heat bubbles. It happened. And it said that he likened the event to the 1908 Tunguska event, which was a 12 megaton meteor that destroyed 80 million trees across 830 square miles in Siberia. You could bring the lights down. Jude, the servant of Jesus, us to contend for the faith. And then he says, I need to remind you of things that have happened so you don't repeat them. So they don't come up again because this is a problem now and God in his glory that could see further into the future lets us know. Let's everyone know forever until the end of time because his word is true that we will always have this problem. That is a good and a bad thing. Good because it proves Jesus' word is true. 
bad because it is a threat to Christianity. It is a threat to our faith. And it is a threat that needs to be dealt with. Not neglected, not feared, not hands off. Dealt with, prayed about, fasted over, spoken against, stood against. You do not have someone that breaks into your house and just, hey man, uh, please go away, but I'm gonna I'm just go in my room and take a nap. So hopefully you're gone when I leave because, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I don't wanna offend you, but this is my house, so please don't come in here. You know, these are my things, but if you wanna take it, I, mean, I guess it's, I can just buy more stuff, it's okay. You know, I didn't really need that in, I don't need my car, I don't need my kids, it's just, you can have them, just kidnap them. <laughs> No, you're going to deal with it aggressively, especially in this state. You have the Second Amendment for a reason. I'm not saying go shoot some false prophets, but for that story. This is an issue. They are here in this town. There is that demonic stronghold in this town. So we cannot confine ourselves to this building and think that's all we need to do is just show up, sing a little bit, sit down and listen to the guy screaming, and then go out into the world and nothing change. I will continue to warn you because your blood will not be on my hands. Anytime you preach the gospel in truth, You will be met with opposition and you will be met with opportunity for reflection and change. And Jude is calling us to remember these events, to remember how they rejected Jesus in the wilderness. But most importantly, to learn and not repeat them and do not fall under a false prophet so he wants to remind you to remember what has happened to focus on what happened and to learn the truth to know the truth so that you will not be deceived by lies it's that serious it's that serious this is real Contending for the faith is real. Hell absolutely hates you. And we see celebrities that get famous and they make deals with the devil and they will have earthly possessions and wealth and status and power. And if you don't thank them, you disappear. Y'all know where I go if I just said that. And for a lot of Christians, we hear that and we're just like, yeah, that's disgusting. Shame on them, you know. Whoa, 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 ba, ba, ba. And the reality is, God loves them just as much as He loves you. God loves Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Hitler. God loves the pedophiles that just got arrested in this city just as much as you do. And as disgusting as their sinful acts are, what should break your heart is their sinful nature. That is how Jesus would look at it. Yes, it's gross. Yes, it's disgusting. No, I probably would not react the correct way if it happened to my children. God's still working on that. But the main focus of Jesus is this is their sinful nature and they need to be saved. They need to repent. It's that serious. It is that serious. Let's bow our heads.
we need you. We need you more than ever in this country, in this church, in this city, in this nation, God. We simply wholeheartedly need you. And with the revival that is birthing, God, I pray, continue to send the lost like never before. Fill this building, fill other buildings, fill churches across this country with preachers and pastors that will stand on your word, that will be anointed by your word, that are chosen by you, that will stand on this because it is unmatched. It is true. Let them not worry about the cares of men. Let us not worry about our reputation any longer. Let us only worry about being faithful and obedient to you. Strike our souls, God, and break us of our sinful nature. back to you. Turn our hearts back to you. Let us become more aware of you, of the spiritual warfare. Let us contend for the faith. Let us be a house of prayer and proclamation and praise. Let us stand up and be emboldened and be courageous and not be afraid of man. Let us only be afraid of the one man who is in charge of our eternal soul. And let us put our soul and our trust and our faith completely in you, God, and stand on your word and meet you at your word and have the faith to go forth into the world and make disciples. Meet us here in this moment. Convict us of our sin. Spoken or unspoken, Holy Spirit, bring it to the surface and refine us in the fire. Test us and change us. Bring the lost home. Bring the lost home. Bring the lost home. Bring the lost home. weakness help us in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless name amen hey i hope that message spoke to you today i want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at family church and those who help support this ministry If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.